I'm Dick Clay. I'm the president and the CEO of the Filson Historical Society. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight, uh, both here in person and also virtually. The topic tonight is someone I'd never heard of, uh, but I'm, I feel like she's part of my family now. Uh, Tula Pendleton, The Life and Work of a Forgotten Southern Writer. Now, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Barbara Pendleton Jones. B.B. Jones is the great niece of Tula Pendleton Cummins. She grew up hearing only the barest account of Tula's career as a writer and her tragic death. When she set out to learn more about her great aunt, she had only two of Tula's letters and fragments of family history. But by piercing, by, by piecing, excuse me, and, and piercing uh, Tula's genealogy, finding her published stories because she was an accomplished author and locating letters and newspaper articles in archives and retracing Tula's steps across much of the South. Jones, a retired psychologist and psychoanalyst, has crafted a moving and illuminating portrait of this extraordinary relative and a relative who really tells the story in so many ways of Kentucky um, post-Civil War up until 1926, I think. And this will be, um, I think, something that everyone will enjoy. Thank you, Bibi. Welcome. The, the way we're going to do this is she will talk, uh, lecture for, uh, what, 10 minutes, and then she and I will do some Q&A, then we'll open it up to the floor, okay? Here we go. I'll get my stuff out of your way. Oh, that's my folder. Yeah. More back? Thank you. No, <laughs> Good evening. I want to thank Dick Clay and the staff of the Filson for the generous invitation to be here with you tonight. And I also want to thank Christy Brown and Todd Sedgwick for hosting my husband and myself here in Louisville. And I want to thank my wonderful Louisville publisher, Carol Butler of Butler Books, for helping to make this book a reality. This book began as an exercise in curiosity. As a child growing up in Atlanta, I had heard from my Kentucky-raised father about my great aunt, Tula Pendleton Cummins. Noteworthy in my Southern family for two things, a career as a writer and a scandalous death in a suicide pact with her husband in 1924. I had so many questions. Who was Tula really? What kind of writing did she do? And was it any good? And why did she and her husband take their own lives? As Dick mentioned, I had almost nothing to go of when I started, just copies of a couple of letters, fragments of a family history that she had compiled that had been copied and recopied and passed around the family. But I, the bits I had, I didn't even know how they fit together. It was just kind of a mismatch. So about eight years ago, as I began to reduce my caseload as a psychologist and psychoanalyst, I had the time to research Tula. And since my husband, Bo, and I were living in Washington, DC at the time, I started at the Library of Congress. There I was able to find most of the short stories that she had published in American magazines, as well as the summary of a screenplay that had been made into a silent movie. Another great resource at the Library of Congress is its Chronicling America project started in 2006. This is a searchable database of American newspapers 
published from, from 1690 to the present. And it includes the two newspapers from Tula's tiny hometown of Hartford, Kentucky in Ohio County. This allowed me to create a timeline of events in Tula's life, which began in 1872. I also found news stories of the couple's death in more than 120 newspapers, mostly in the US, but a few abroad. I tracked down descendants of the brother who had served as her executor, and finally obtained an intact copy of her genealogical project. I spent two weeks in Kentucky in 2017, visiting Tula's birthplace of Hartford and several of the towns that she had lived in while she was working on genealogy and history projects, and the Kentucky Historical Society in Frankfurt. One of my Kentucky weeks was spent right here at the Filson, where Google had told me about the Knoll family papers, which concerned uh, the family of Tula's mother, um, Ida Emily Knoll. In a funny irony, I didn't find out until two years later that the Knoll family papers had been donated by my cousin Tom, who's here tonight, Tom Sabetta, um, who has been a uh, consistent supporter of my book. I found more letters uh, written by Tula in another archive at the University of Virginia. And the icing on the cake was my cousin Tom's discovery in an old locked trunk in his garage of the only photos I have of Tula except for a very grainy image that had appeared in one of the obituaries. I have brought originals of these photos today to be included in the Knoll family papers here at the Filson. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. So who was Tula and why does she matter? Tula was the author of several dozen short stories published in American magazines between 1907 and 1921, and of a screenplay made into a silent movie in 1915. Obituaries described her as a well-known writer, but this was a bit misleading. She had published under her initials and her maiden name, T.D. Pendleton, in order to be, in order to avoid being identified as a woman. Um, at some point, she came to the attention of America's foremost curator of short stories at that time. And having embarked on a novel and on a biography of Poe, she seemed headed toward a brilliant career. But her husband Holmes increasingly severe asthma, untreatable except by morphine in the early 20th century, led to the end of her writing after 1921 and ultimately to the couple's double suicide in 1924. Tula's story is noteworthy for several reasons. Her literary success in national publications her love of Abraham Lincoln, despite her descent from generations of slave owners and a father who was a surgeon in the Confederate Army. Her sympathy for people on the margins of society. Her nuanced portrayals of women in relationships. Her perceptive de depiction of small town life. And the strange tragedies in her family. There was an adoption gone wrong. There was a brother who was tried and probably wrongly acquitted of murder for murder, and a brother-in-law who had surreptitiously committed suicide. There was her heroic nursing of a desperately ill husband and her decision to end her life along with him long before the right to die became a prominent concept. 
Then there was the extraordinary attention that the couple's suicide att attracted as attested by coverage in more than 120 newspapers in the US and abroad. And yet, Tula is the quintessential forgotten woman. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She was the daughter of Hartford's beloved physician, a former surgeon in the Confederate Army, and his second wife, an artist. Tula was the descendant of generations of Virginians and later Kentuckians with origins in England. Her ancestors were largely middle-class, comfortable, but not wealthy, farmers and often physicians. From her parents, both avid readers, she inherited a love of literature. She was born into a ready-made family with five older half-siblings from her father's first wife, but these were really more like three-quarter siblings since her father's first wife and Tula's mother were sisters. Probably the most significant event in her young life was the death of her younger brother when she was only two and a half. Later, when she was seven, an extravagant party given by her parents in her honor, described as a juvenile masked ball with catered food, music, tropical fruits and flowers, suggests that she was the apple of her parents' eyes. After elementary school in Hartford, Tula attended a girls' boarding school in Richmond, Virginia, graduating at the age of 14, which was not at all uncommon in that day. Her life between the ages of 14 and 21 appears to have followed a normal course for a young woman in a small Southern town. Some teaching in the local elementary school, a course in shorthand, social outings, visit to friends and family in other cities and towns. Memorably, she visited the famed Columbian exhibition in Chicago with her father in 1893, something that she wrote about years later. And then Tula met the love of her life, a young man from Memphis. James Holmes Cummins Jr., who would marry her in 1894 and take her away from small town life for good. Holmes, as he was known, was the oldest son of a well-known railroad lobbyist and democratic power broker from Memphis. Holmes had chosen not to follow in his father's legal or political footsteps and instead opted for a career in business, becoming a well-respected figure in the insurance industry in the South. After the death of Holmes' father, the couple moved to Richmond, Virginia and traveled often for his work. As the early years of their marriage went by, the expected babies failed to appear and a letter suggests that Tula had at least one miscarriage. The couple moved to Lynchburg in about 1904 when Holmes was asked to be secretary of a new insurance firm. At some point between 1904 and 1910, the couple apparently arranged to adopt a young girl somewhere between the ages of 10 and 16 who was born in about 1894. Her name, Elise Nicholas, pops up in the 1910 census as their adopted daughter. The adoption evidently did not go well and the girl left their home by at least 1912. The Cummins' lives took a somber turn in 1909 when the insurance company that Holmes served as an executive went out of business. This event seems to have led both to the couple's financial failure and to the onset or worsening of Holmes' asthma. There followed several years of harrowing illness and unemployment. There were no effective treatments for asthma in the early 20th century, and doctors prescribed morphine for the worst attacks. Morphine did relieve the acute feeling of suffocation, but obviously didn't affect the underlying illness, and of course carried the risk that the patient would develop tolerance to the drug, 
needing more as time went on, or even addiction. Tula had begun to write occasional essays and stories for publication as early as 1907, perhaps initially to occupy her time, but after their financial failure to put bread on the table. She published 30 stories in national magazines between 1907 and 1921, while apparently working simultaneously on drafts of a novel and a biography of Poe, neither of which has survived. Her stories included dramas, romances, tales with an element of the supernatural, undoubtedly influenced by her beloved Poe, stories about women in troubled relationships, and a series of stories depicting small town life. In 1905, Tula's stories attracted the attention of um, America's foremost curator of short stories, Edward J. O'Brien. In his volumes of American short stories of 1915 and 1916, he awarded asterisks for five of Tula's stories, meaning that in his scheme, they were distinguished either for their technique or for their substance. Indeed, her stories are worth reading for the evocative power of her depiction of relationships and her acute powers of observation. I drew on my training as a psychoanalyst to speculate about her personality and her internal themes and conflicts as revealed in her writings. And with the enthusiastic agreement of Carol Butler, we decided to include all of her published stories in the book. So they're all there. Um, in an undated letter, but probably in the fall of 1915, Tula wrote in desperation to her brother, Eugene Pendleton, or Jean, a physician and my grandfather, accepting his offer to consult with Holmes, whose asthma was taking a terrible toll. Although there is no documentation, family members always said that Jean had treated Holmes and that he had improved for several years for he was able to return to work. After they left Lynchburg in 1910, they lived in Kentucky for the next decade or so as she pursued some new projects. The, the draft of a novel, the biography of Poe, a genealogical project that she undertook for her brother, Ned, who had led some, lent some money to the struggling couple, and a proposed history of Lincoln County. In about 19, oh, sorry, in about 1919, the Cummins returned to Richmond where Holmes started an insurance firm with a partner. But at some point in the early 1920s, Holmes' asthma must have worsened again. And at age 54, he decided that he could no longer tolerate life as he knew it. The couple's suicide plan was carried out at around four in the morning on April 2nd, 1924 in the Cummins apartment in Richmond. Tula aimed a revol re revolver at her heart and pulled the trigger. Holmes took the pistol and shot himself in the head. He died instantly, but she lay mortally wounded until a concerned colleague of Holmes summoned the police almost 12 hours later in the afternoon. The police and the coroner broke the door down um, to find Tula barely conscious. She was, however, able to tell the officials that it had been a planned double suicide, not a murder suicide, and that she did not want to live. She lingered for three more days in the hospital before dying on April 5th. All of her private papers, which must have been voluminous, disappeared after her death. My guess is that they were taken back to Oklahoma by her brother, Ned, whom she had chosen to be her executor, but he died only three years later. And although his widow lived many more years, at some point their house burned to the ground. And so I think that's what happened to her private papers. I'm gonna read from one of Tula's stories called The Stature, which is dialect for statue. 
because it illustrates the complexity of this daughter of a Confederate officer born only seven years after the close of the Civil War. The stature is one of only two stories that Tula wrote of featuring Appalachian characters and mountain dialect. The statue referred to in the title is the bronze statue of Abraham Lincoln in your state house, installed in 1909. And the visitor in the story, the visitor to the statue is a poor widow from Appalachia with her eight little sons. I'm going to forgo the Appalachian accent except when the widow is speaking. They saw a strange procession entering a woman in a calico dress with a little figure in her arms, followed by seven more little figures of assorted sizes, clothed all alike in blue cotton jeans breeches, held up by homemade galluses. At the feet of the big bronze statue, the woman stopped and gathering her brood close around her said, that's him boys. That's what I brought you from home to see. Look, boys, and don't ever forget it as long as you live. Ever since your pa's been laying out there on the mountain under the cedar, I've felt a terrible responsibility at having the raising of eight men chilling. And when I saw the bill advertising the excursion, tacked up at the crossroads, I made up my mind to bring you on it, no matter how much scrimping it would take to save the price of the tickets. I figured that there weren't no better thing that I could do for you than to bring you on a pilgrimage to the Capitol to see him standing there. Beckoning to the little Jean's breeches figures to gather close around the feet of the statue, she went on. It ain't his looks, boys. Nobody ever called him Purdy. It's what he stands for. That sad look you notice on his face wasn't for himself. It was still there after the world had given him the highest it had to offer. It was for the other fellows, them at the bottom. It ain't in reason that I can ever do much for you boys, but I didn't want you to begin life hopeless, thinking you haven't got a chance. You may think you haven't got a thing to start out with, but I tell you, you are rich. Your joint heirs with every human being born under the flag of the thing that the man you're looking at stands for. Everybody's got a chance because he saved it for them. I don't believe our lawmakers will ever get so crooked that the Republic will be a failure because I don't believe such love as the man of the stature had could be in vain. <laughs> Phoebe, this is utterly fascinating, and I had no idea who Tula was. Neither before, did anybody else. <laughs> before I read this, this marvelous book. And I, I think one of the themes of her life is money and the lack of money. Can you talk to us about that a bit? Well, I think like many people growing up in small towns, they were not wealthy, but they were comfortable enough. Um, they had the basics that they needed. The family were able to travel occasionally and, and they had the pleasures of books um, and music in the house, which her pa pa parents both loved. Um, their real problems with money started in 1909 with the failure of Holmes's company. And so he was thrown out of work, um, thrown into a much more severe stage of his asthma. I don't know whether it had existed before then, but certainly it became much worse after that. And I'm sure that the strain of unemployment had something to do with it. Um, so they spent really the rest of their lives worried about money um, and scrambling. And uh, one of the interesting things that I learned was I, I had said to myself, well, you know, Holmes's family was wealthy. Why didn't they help this struggling couple out? And well, it turns out they did help them. 
but it came at a price and the price was supervision by her mother-in-law. And I think and, and that- And nosy questions, <laughs> right? And I think that indeed, Holmes and Tula had not been careful enough with money during the good years that they, you know, they lived well, they stayed in the better hotels and had a good standard of life. And they just didn't think about putting money aside for a rainy day. And that rainy day came. <laughs> then the mystery of the adopted daughter, could you talk to us a bit more about that? Because throughout your narrative, you emphasize the, I, 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 you don't come out and say they were lonely, but that was the impression that I had, that, that as a couple, they were totally immersed in each other, but there were voids and gaps. And perhaps that was the role they had hoped for with this adopted daughter. Well, I think that's right. I think that she was probably more isolated than he was. He, 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 he did enjoy social life. He was a member of several clubs in Richmond and enjoyed that kind of thing. She did not. Um, but um, at some point while they were living in Lynchburg, this adoption came about. Um, I, you know, I had to, I had to sort of guess who this Elise Nicholas was that was born in 1894. But there was an Elise Nicholas born in 1894 in Lynchburg, and they were living in Lynchburg at the time. And the girl had lost her mother at a young age. Now, in those days, um, I think fathers were much less involved with their children than they are now. And I don't know why her father didn't feel that he could continue to raise this little girl or why she didn't go to one of her aunts. But at any rate, this adoption came about. And as best I can piece it together, I don't think it was ever a good fit. I think the the, the young girl was fairly headstrong. Um, and at some point, it seems to me that probably both because of a misfit in their personalities and also because of the family's financial failure, I think they probably said, you're gonna have to make your own way. So she went briefly to become a nursing student at Shenandoah. University in Winchester, Virginia, didn't stay long, went off to visit a wealthy aunt in New York City. And after she had been at the aunt's for only two weeks, she disappeared. She just disappeared. The family were frantic through connections that they had. They got, you know, a half a dozen New York City detectives on the case. They found her two weeks later, drunk and passed out in a hallway. And she was never able to say really what all had gone on in that two weeks. But uh, in front of the judge, um, the um, the judge inquired of her aunt, you know, what was to become of this young woman? And, and the aunt announced firmly that she was being sent back to Virginia. So she was sent back to Virginia to her original family. The counterpoint uh, of the adopted daughter and her lack of a relationship with her father uh, would be Tula's close relationship with her father. Can you talk to us about that? I, she manifestly adored her father. And in one of the letters that I was able to find in the archive at the University of Virginia, there's a striking passage describing her writing behind her father on a horse as he would make his house calls. And there's a lovely memory of them returning to her village late at night on a summer evening, nine o'clock at night. And uh, the father stops because someone flags him down and needs him, him to write a prescription for his wife's misery. And uh, they hear an odd sound coming from across the street, a tap, tap, tapping. And the, the father jerks his head over and says, old Sam is working late tonight. Um, and he, what he was referring to was that someone was making a coffin. And so uh, the guy that he's talking to says, so-and-so died this afternoon. 
And she said, I will never forget that night and the uncanny sound of that tap, tap, tapping. And even today, many years later, if I heard that sound again, it would bring back the entire, you know, episode and the entire atmosphere, mixing both thrill and fright. I mean, I think she was fascinated by the whole atmosphere of the thing, but it shows you, I think, how close the two of them were, that he would take her on his, uh, you know, visits to his patients. And I think that they must have often talked about medicine because she's clearly interested in medicine. And about a half a dozen of her stories involve medical topics of one kind or another. I was interested in how a young woman from Hartford, Kentucky would end up in a girl's boarding school or finishing school, I suppose, if you would, in, in Richmond, Virginia. And I, I wish you'd talk to us a bit about that. It, what hit me was one, her parents must have loved her very much and perhaps sacrificed financially, but two, she must have been extremely precocious and bright. I think she was precocious and bright. And I think that the family highly valued education. Um, her father had been tutored in the elements, ele elements of Greek and Latin as a boy. Um, and so that was something that was really important to them. And I think that he was one of the ones who helped to organize the tiny town of Hartford to raise money for an educational institution that would be called Hartford College. It was not a college to begin with, although it later included uh, a college curriculum. Um, but this little tiny town raised $100,000 um, to, is that right, Tom? Is it, I can't remember if it was, yeah, to build this building, you know, in, in the 1870s, I think. Um, anyway, I don't know too much about the choice of the academy in Richmond. Um, I assume that it had a good reputation and they probably wanted to do the best that they could for her. Now, I was curious that uh, either she chose not to pursue college or they did not encourage college because you could, by the time she was of the appropriate age, you could get a college degree in Hartford. And her future sister-in-law, who was my grandmother, did get a college degree in Hartford in those days. So I don't really know why that didn't happen, whether they couldn't afford it or whether it just wasn't important enough. Medicine, I think, as you said, is a constant theme in many of her short stories. Her father was a country general practitioner, as was her brother, who took over her dad's practice. Talk to us about her her knowledge of medicine and her love of medicine. She was really interested in a lot of different aspects of medicine. In her stories, she mentions um, the, the germ theory of disease, which was relatively recent, um, Koch and she talks about the use of hypnosis, which was in its very early days in the, during the Civil War. Um, they used hypnosis as a substitute for anesthesia when they were short on supplies of anesthesia. Um, she was also interested in uh, you know, other aspects of illness. And um, interestingly, she wrote perceptively about the economics of practicing medicine in those days. Um, she talked about how during her father's days, you did not need to have a specialty in order to uh, make a living as a doctor, but that even a generation later when her brother became a doctor, it became tougher to make a good living as a general practitioner, and uh, it was more desirable to seek a specialty. Mm -hmm. But her by that time, her brother already had like five children, and that wasn't really possible. The house in which she grew up for her first 20 years, I guess, yeah. um, is in Ohio County, where Hartford is the county seat. And uh, Tom, help me out here. Is, is Hartford about 2,500, 5,000 people? Um. <laughs> So this 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 I don't I don't believe the town was any larger than. No, I think it was fewer than five hundred in Tula's day. All right, so, so it's really little. A county seat of five hundred people, and 
tell us about the house. I've, I've seen a picture in the book, but I, I'd love your description. It's a beautiful house. It was built between about 1861 and 1866. It was half finished when John Edward Pendleton returned from the Civil War. He had, uh, I think the I think the ex the brick exterior was complete. It's as many houses were in those days. It was a sort of an Italianate style with a turret in the front. Um, he had had valuable flooring shipped up the Mississippi River to the Ohio to the Green River to the Rough River, which went on the back of their property. And Yankee soldiers had stayed in the in the house during the war and had burnt all the flooring, so he had to start over again with the flooring. But the house is still lovely. Um, it was a it was operated as a bed and breakfast for a while. Tom and I attended a, a family reunion there in the late '90s when it was a bed and breakfast. Now it has been um, acquired by a businessman from Owensboro. As a project, he and his wife still live in Owensboro, but they are slowly renovating the house. And um, Tom and I are going to host a little dinner there on Saturday night. Yeah. Fine. Um, she published under, I think, different male names. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, as I mentioned, most of her stories were published under her initials and her maiden name, T.D. Pendleton. And she said it was to avoid being identified as a woman. She felt like her chances of publication were better if she didn't, um, if she wasn't identified as a woman. Um, one of her stories, which was published in probably the most popular magazine that she published in, I think it was the one that was, I think it was called People's Home Journal. It sounds a lot like Ladies' Home Journal, but I think it was called the People's Home Journal. She published under two, uh, I think she published under T.D. Pendleton Cummins, and I'm not quite sure why she used a different name for that one than for the others, but one thing occurred to me, which was that maybe she felt like this was a story for a uh, more popular type of magazine, and that she wanted to distinguish it from some of the stories that she published in more sort of highbrow magazines that she was hoping would have a different kind of resonance. Let's dig a little more deeply into the role of women, Southern women of a certain class uh, in the South uh, post-war uh, in this period that frequently we refer to as the lost cause period. How did she negotiate that? Well, it's, you know, I have to infer all of this, um, but um, as we all know, back in those days, um, women kind of were expected to live up to the ideal of the Southern woman. And that included um, values like uh, modesty, you know, sort of diligence, um, uh, uh, lack of uh, agency, <laughs> lack of agency, <laughs> and um, purity, chastity, and so forth and so on. And um, it was a model that was remarkably constraining for many women, obviously. And, you know, her literary contemporary, Ellen Glasgow, um, wrote uh, a book uh, which was thinly veiled portrait of her mother's, you know, sort of struggles with living in this kind of world. Um, and um, Obviously, the war, as wars tend to do, did begin to change things. So women, you know, during the Civil War stepped up to fulfill some of the roles that men would have fulfilled had they not been off fighting. Um, and in some cases, those women, you know, did so very successfully and, and in some cases stayed in those positions even after the men came home. So things did begin to change. Now, I have no idea how... Um, much in her own family, she uh, 
shook the waters. I, I, I would doubt very much. You know, I, I, you know, I think that she was probably a fairly dutiful daughter, and I think that her parents were fairly conventional, although had a lot more sort of intellectual interest than some couples would have had at the time. So I, you know, I think that she probably negotiated as delicately as she could. I was fascinated by the agency she seemed to exercise in their travels and their, I mean, we have her in Lynchburg, uh, then I think in Richmond for a while, in Memphis at the early years of her marriage. Then they come back to Kentucky. They're in Hartford for quite some time, but they go to, to Middlesbrough. What was that all about? Actually, I think during those years between 1910 and 1919, when they were living in Kentucky, I'm not sure she spent any time in Hartford. Ah. I think they were going to towns where she was, um, well, she had two goals in mind. One was to find a climate that would be um, uh, more helpful for homes with his asthma. And that was one reason that they went to Middlesbrough. Uh, and they also went to uh, Frankfurt and Stanford, which I guess were sort of slightly higher altitude. I don't. I should know my Kentucky geography better, but um, you're close. Okay. You're, I mean, it, it's, that's pretty good. Um, so that was one thing she had in mind. The other thing she had in mind was some projects that she was working on. I told you about. You know, she thought about doing a history of Lincoln County, so she spent some time in Stanford. You know, doing digging into the archives there and I've been to see some of those archives and they probably look pretty much like they did back in her day you know there's still the old wooden filing cabinets and it's it's kind of a fascinating exercise um but so I think you know she traveled to some of these places for health reasons some of them for her research purposes but I think that the two of them did kind of enjoy traveling around and seeing different parts of the country and of the state. Her correspondence with a woman named Nancy Bird Turner, could you talk to us about that? Uh, that what hit me was, was that she wrote out of deep loneliness and need for a female friend with whom to confide. That's absolutely right. When, when During the years that she was living in Kentucky, although she had her beloved husband with her and he collaborated with her actively bouncing ideas, you know, for her stories and would help her with the choice of a word. He was always deeply interested in her work, but she missed having a female intellectual companion. So Nancy Bird Turner was a writer from Virginia whose poetry she had seen in publications, the Boston Evening Transcript, among other publications. She admired her work. She wrote to her out of the blue. I think the first letter was maybe 1915. She wrote to her out of the blue proposing um, just a correspondence and said, you know, I'm intellectually isolated and maybe this would appeal to you too. And uh, so Nancy Bird Turner took her up on this and they exchanged um, at least a dozen letters over the next two years. I only, unfortunately, have been able to see the letters that she wrote to Nancy Bird Turner, because presumably Nancy's letters to her disappeared with all the rest of her papers. But the funny thing was that, you know, Google had led me to the fact that these letters of Tula's existed in the Nancy Bird Turner papers at the University of Virginia, but I did not race down to look at them. Why not? Well, because when I looked up a little bit about Nancy Bird Turner, I saw that she was an editor at the Youth's Companion, which was one of the magazines that Tula submitted stories to, published stories in. So I thought to myself, oh, this won't be very interesting. It'll be, you know, here's my story. Here's $25, you know. So I, it, it took me two years to get down there. And then when I went down there, here was this wonderful trove of a half a dozen long, long letters from Tula, which gave me the best glimpse into her interior life that I had apart from her stories. And in the stories, you're having to do a lot of inference. But here it was right on the printed page and it gave me 
you know, the best knowledge that I had of, of her psychology. And these were in the small special collections library at UVA? Exactly. It's, yeah. it's um, one of the most exciting places in the world, I think. Um, Tula and the magazines in which she published and the amount of money that conceivably she made in doing so. Tell us about that. Well, she started off, as you would imagine, publishing in less well-known publications. She published, I think, her very first story. Oh, here's, you can all help me with this. Her first story was published in a short-lived magazine published right here in Louisville, Kentucky, called Our Country. It didn't last for very long. That is the one story I have not been able to find. So look in your attics. <laughs> uh, and if anybody can think of any place that you could think of to look for an old copy of a magazine called Our Country, let me know. And I'm particularly interested in finding that story for another reason, because it was a apparently a beautiful portrait of an old black Southern nanny. And it's the title of the story is The Passing of a Lady and talked about the character of this remarkable woman. Well, that wasn't something that you would see every day back in those days, that kind of story. So I'm very eager to lay my hands on it if ever I can. Would she published in a nursing journal. Uh, she published in some more sort of niche magazines like um, The Smart Set. That was kind of a sophisticated magazine out of New York. She published in something called the San Francisco Argonaut which again was a more sort of highbrow publication published in San Francisco. Uh, and then she published um, a, maybe between half a dozen and 10 stories in the Youth's Companion, which unlike what you might think was not just for young people, the whole family read the Youth's Companion. Um, and so it, it, it had a you know large following. And then there was that one story in the People's Home Journal. Um, there was one early story published in Outdoor Magazine. You know, she published wherever she could find. And I don't have any particular figures on what she might have earned, but it wouldn't have been very much. If she had been able to live into the 20s and 30s, she could have made some real money because in those days, some of these magazines had huge circulations. And sometimes, you know, Authors were paid five thousand dollars for a story, or thirty thousand dollars for a series of stories. So she, if she'd been able to hang on, she could have earned some money. Um, how do I put this? Tula and enslavement. Tula and relationships with African American people both as a, we've, we haven't really talked about her photography skills, but as a photographer and as a writer, and Tula as the daughter of uh, a Confederate soldier, uh, but a daughter who idolized Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And also Tula, who I think did a film, was it with D.W. Griffith or she wanted to... to... It was with a colleague of D.W. Griffith, I think. And I I am, I, I think it's quite likely that she met D.W. Griffith at some point. So basically we have Tula here at a time in the nation's history where the KKK was rampant, uh, where Woodrow Wilson, who... Uh, in many ways was a wonderful president, but not so much when it came to um, uh, racism. Talk to us about how Tula navigated those treacherous shoals. Well, Tula was the descendant of generations of people who owned enslaved persons in both in Virginia and Kentucky. And that's just the grim truth of it. Um, her father was listed in the slave census of 1950 as owning five enslaved persons between the ages of like nine and 30 something. Um, 
So there was that that was something that you know shaped her uh, sensibility. Um, she, in her writing, she never addressed slavery directly, but there are many indications of a sympathetic attitude toward enslaved people. She writes approvingly of the will of, of one of her forebears who freed some of his enslaved people upon his death. There was a very heart-wrenching story about um, uh, an uh, enslaved person who was kidnapped from West Africa, as so many were, and brought up the river to live near Charlottesville, and that he had been a king in his own country and that he pined for his homeland and kept looking down the river because he knew that that's where he had come from and that one day he walked into the river and never came back. Um, and so she wrote very poignantly. Um, and so, you know, I want to find the story about the, you know, the, the, the called the passing of a lady. There was a lovely story that she wrote about a young, black serving girl in a Virginia inn. Um, and she it's, it's, a, it's a story about a young girl who's being bullied by her cousin and she's a nervous wreck. Um, and the uh, narrator of the story is a young writer with his kind of childlike wife there. They take pity on this young girl and they ask her what's the matter. And then one day she appears just transformed and that she's She's kind of had an awakening and she's learned how to stand up for herself and whoop the cousin who had been bullying her. It's a, it's a, it's a great story. It's called yeah, The Amaz Blooming of Amazonia. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Which leads to the importance of Tula. Now, you're... Um, a very accomplished psychologist and psychoanalyst. Thanks. And you write beautifully. Thank you. And with a, a person just writing a family history, Tula might be interesting, but not universal. Somehow or another, what you've done, I think, is you made her an utterly, entirely sympathetic woman who has um, universalism. That there, there are themes and things that she writes about that make her important, not only to women, but to men as well. Can you talk to us about that. Well, I think she does write about universal themes, about friendship, about community, about both the pleasures and the difficulties of living in a very small community, um, the nosiness, the gossip, and so forth and so on. Um, she writes very perceptively about women's relationships, both with other women and with men. Um, and um, one thing that troubled me before I found the um, letters in the archive at the University of Virginia was that there are a number of stories that depict women in abusive relationships or even what we would call a sadomasochistic relationship. And I, I worried, well, maybe this is what her relationship is like. Is that, is that what the story is with her and Holmes? And so it was a complete joy to discover in these letters at the University of Virginia that they had a very close and loving relationship and were true sort of intellectual partners. Um, but I do think that she does touch on universal themes. Um, I'm not a literature professor. It's not for me to say what her place in the canon of Southern literature is. You know, I don't think that she has the standing of someone like Ellen Glasgow or Kate Chopin or um, a little bit later Eudora Welty, in part because she didn't have the body of work, you know, the she didn't have time to write the, the, that amount of 
work. Um, but I think her stories are good. Um, and I think that they are worth rescuing from oblivion, which was one of my goals in writing this book. This is a woman who, in part because of the stigma of suicide in the early 1900s, they just disappeared um, from you know, memory. And for a long time, I didn't even know where they were buried. Um, so one of my objectives was to rescue this brave, interesting, talented woman from oblivion. So. Thank you for that. <laughs> we have time for a few questions. Scott's telling me we have two minutes. Um, does anyone have a question? If so, come to one of the mics. Oh, good. Hello. Um, and feel for... free to, to introduce yourself as well. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Hollister. I'm a student of U of L. Um, and I just kind of wondered how much of a, a benefit or how much of your training as a psychologist uh, in psychology that you used for this book. Obviously, like, you know, writing well was one of them, but like, did you find that that enabled you to get more into a mindset? Well, you know, I did try to, you know, use a sort of psychological lens in sort of looking both at her stories and in her letters to sort of tease out, you know, what what were this woman's principal motivations, you know, what were her sort of internal conflicts, um, that kind of thing. Um, but of course, it's always a little hard to do that kind of thing from a distance. Um, and um, that was what was so thrilling about finding those letters. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, my name's Larry Sloan. And uh, like Dick, it sounds like you've got some universal themes. One of them that maybe is appropriate for today is mental illness. It sounds like there's a lot of mental illness going on in this family and what they're dealing with health-wise, anxiety, depression, and so forth. And I just wondered if you would comment on that. Yeah, I think that um, as I tried to tease out why she committed suicide, um, you know, I did consider that she was in a severe depression. It wouldn't have been uh, unlikely given the circumstances that they were living. He was desperately ill. They had no income. He had not been able to work for about six months before they ended their lives. Um, and I think that they felt like they had exhausted, you know, the help of their respective families. But I ended up thinking, no, I don't think that's what it was. I think that she decided that she took a clear eyed look at what her future would be like, um, and that she was 52 years old. It, in those days, that seemed a lot older than it does to us now. Um, that she was not in great health. I don't know exactly what her problems were, but she referred to having some health problems. And I think that, you know, and, and Holmes was the love of her life and her principal intellectual companion. And I think she just didn't want to go on without him. Uh, he did have a brother who also committed suicide. And that seems to be pretty clearly that his brother fell into a severe depression after the death of their father. And, um, but I, I, you know, Holmes, apart from, you know, this, act of desperation at the end of a long, long and terrifying illness. He had no other history of mental illness. He, he was a well-adjusted, well-liked member of the community. Um, uh, mental illness probably was not discussed very much in those days. It was not. a real uh, thing that you didn't want to tell people about. Right. Is that right? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you for the question. Hi, I'm Ann Wells. Um, it, this is probably very repetitive because of the previous question, uh, but it, it seemed that this woman was a fairly independent woman. I mean, at her at, at that time to write and send off articles was pretty amazing, and uh, so that the fact that she would commit suicide, I mean, I would have thought even at fifty two that she would have said, "Well, I I can earn money by myself." So. Yeah, you know, she she hadn't published anything for several years, um, and her writing had really tailed off as he got more and more desperately ill. So I think that 
she kind of felt like she was out of the groove, you know, that she was, she would have to almost start over again. And um, she knew what uh, life was like for people of no means um, at that time. And it wasn't a pretty picture. You know, she had relatives who grew up, um, four, four girls who were orphaned and had to live on the, you know, charity of their family. And she knew them very well. And I think it was not an attractive picture to her. What Were her parents still alive? No, they had both Neither. died. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the Filson Historical Society, I'd like to thank our author, Bibi. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs>